Great. All right, so thank you to everyone who's already signing on. We're gonna give it a few minutes to make sure that um, everybody who signed up for this webinar can get in and get situated before we get started. So if you just give us a two or three minutes and hang tight, we will get started. All right, again, welcome to everybody who's already signed on. We're just going to give it another minute or two to make sure everybody has the opportunity to get signed on and get situated before we start our webinar. So if you just give us a minute um, and we will be started here on our webinar about Alexander Twilight. All right, so it looks like we have a good number of people signed on. So let's get started. I am here to welcome you to this webinar, which is sponsored by Historic New England and the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village in Vermont. Uh, I am Claire Sadar. I am the program manager here at Historic New England, and we are the largest, oldest regional preservation organization in the country. Um, I just wanna give you a few heads up and tips before we get started. Um, if you want to ask questions, we will be at answering questions at the end of the webinar. So please put them in the Q&A function. There should be a button that in your menu that says Q&A. Um, you can ask your questions there and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, if we don't get to your question or if you have additional questions, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of this program with the, and with the emails of uh, Dr. Hart and Molly, um, the uh, representative here from the Old Stone House Museum, so that you can get in contact with them uh, if you uh, have additional questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte. Um, she is our community preservation manager in Vermont and she is going to introduce our speakers and our co-sponsor tonight. Charlotte. Great, well, uh, thanks Claire. And welcome everybody. Uh, we're pleased to present tonight's program on his own resources, the enigmatic Alexander Twilight in partnership with the Old Stone House Museum and partnerships like this are central to Historic New England's work as a regional heritage organization. And we're looking forward to co-sponsoring additional programs with the museum in the coming months. I'd like to first introduce Molly Vasey, who's the director of the Old Stone House Museum to tell you a bit about their mission and work. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Good evening, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here today. The first of hopefully many programs as a result of an exciting new partnership with Historic New England. My name is Molly Vasey. I'm the Executive Director of the Old Stone House and Historic Museum and Historic Village in Brownington, Vermont. This evening, we are going to learn a great deal about a great man, Alexander Lucius Twilight, the first black person to graduate from an American college and to serve as our country's first black legislator in the Vermont House of Representatives in 1836. 
Twilight became the main protagonist of the Old Stone House Museum story in his role as headmaster of the Orleans County Grammar School from 1829 to 1855. He was a very progressive educator who taught both male and female students. The Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village is a stunning pastoral compilation of historic buildings in the very heart of the Bronington Historic District. The four-story granite dormitory built by his own hands and now our museum building is a physical manifestation of the will and conviction of Mr. Twilight. The house he built with his wife, Mercy, upon settling the village still stands across the dirt road from the dormitory and now serves as our administrative building, gift shop and archive. To spend any amount of time in this very special corner of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, steeped in history and rural beauty, one is struck by a deep admiration of this man, Alexander Twilight. Because of him, the museum is more than simply a collection of historic buildings. We are a museum that serves as a place where a positive story about the African-American experience is made real. These buildings, along with five others that share common threads of history, plus 60 acres of agricultural land, comprise the enchanting historic village for which our organization cares. Thank you all so very much for supporting our work and for those and to those of you who made donations which will benefit both Historic New England and the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village. If you are interested in learning more about the Old Stone House or would like to support or get involved, please visit our website or reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to hear from anyone at any time. And I know that Claire has plans to um, email my contact information following the, the webinar. So thanks to William. Thanks to Historic New England. Very much looking forward to this. Great. Thanks, Molly. And uh, now on to the reason we're gathered here tonight. We're honored to have Bill Hart with us to share his research on Alexander Twilight and to shed some light on this remarkable story. A professor emeritus of history, Bill taught a broad range of American and Atlantic world history courses at Middlebury College between 1993 and 2020. He has lectured and published widely on Black Americans and Native Americans during the colonial and early Republic eras. Bill's article, Building Knowledge, Erecting Liberia College, appeared in the summer 2018 issue of Historic New England Magazine. And most recently, he published, I Am a Man, Martin Henry Freeman and the Problems of Race, Manhood, and Colonization in the publication Slavery and the University, Histories and Legacies. This past summer, the University of Massachusetts Press published Bill's book, For the Good of Their Souls, Performing Christianity in 18th Century Mohawk Country. Bill is currently writing a biography of Alexander Twilight. So Bill, thank you very much and we take it away. All right, thank you very much, Charlotte, for that uh, introduction. And first, I would simply like to thank Charlotte and Ken Torino uh, of Historic New England, and also Molly Nessie of the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village for inviting me to speak to you tonight about Alexander Twilight. And I also want to thank um, uh, Bob Hunt and Reverend Dan Wright. Uh, Reverend Dan Wright is a former pastor at the Brownington Congregational Church. Bob Hunt is the archivist at the, the Old Stone House Museum. I want to thank them for sharing their expertise on Twilight and the school and the church. I found their, uh, their insights uh, invaluable. And many thanks to all of you <clears throat> who are uh, Zooming in this evening to hear me speak about Alexander Twilight. So Alexander Twilight, as Molly has already alluded to, has, is really noteworthy for a number of accomplishments. He was the first uh, Black American to receive a college degree from a college, that's Middlebury College, where I taught for 27 years. He received his degree in 1823. He was the first Black American, we believe, to be elected to a state legislature. That is the Vermont's uh, Assembly, of course, in uh, 1836. First Black headmaster of a public school in Vermont. This is the Orleans County Grammar School in, in Brownington. And of course, as Molly alluded to, he built this magnificent building, a dormitory for his students at the Brownington School that he named Athenian Hall. And I was afraid this might happen. I think I'm going to have to stop sharing for a second and then hop back on. <clears throat> because this... And now I will share again to see if I can get my PowerPoint 
to do what it's supposed to do. Are you with you? Okay. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I have to speak to tech about this. Anyway, yes, so on the left-hand side, you can see Athenian Hall that Twilight built between 1834 and 1836. And we believe he probably patterned that after Painter Hall on the right. This is the first building, it's actually the second building built on Middlebury's campus between 1812 and 1814. And you can see there's some resemblances between these two buildings. The roof lines are a little different, but other than that, the size and scale and scope are, are pretty similar. Um, and, and so the, the, there is the legend that he perhaps built this on his own resources. Um, Reverend uh, Clark Farron at the uh, Congregational Church in Heinsburg uh, made this claim in 1868 that he built this on his own resources. And as uh, Molly alluded to, he certainly did put a lot of sweat, labor, and equity into building the structure. Uh, but there is documentation at the old Stone House Museum archive that indicates he also um, got help from stone, skilled stonemasons uh, in the village and also some financial resources to help build this structure. Nevertheless, these stories do add to um, Twilight's mystery, uh, I would say. Uh, and I, he, these other accomplishments, I would argue, he accomplished on his own resources as well. And here I mean by his own resources is that he accomplished these, these remarkable feats uh, through his own will, his own determination, and all his own terms. And this is remarkable for us today in the 21st century when we consider that Alexander Twilight was African American. And perhaps even more remarkable, which really adds to his mystery, is that during his lifetime, Twilight never identified as African American. And part of my project then is to kind of complicate what that means. Why didn't he? What was happening in the 19th century that he chose not to overtly publicly identify as African American? Well, until the 1970s, Twilight's racial identity went largely unmentioned. Um, some of his students described him as, as swarthy and as having a bronzed and mirth producing face. But these words are really descriptive of his complexion. They're not necessarily indicators of his race. Uh, however, some residents in Corinth, where he grew up as, as a kid, um, did say that they knew that the Twilight family uh, was African American. Um, but it was really in 1974 that Gregor Heilman, who was the editor of the Middlebury Magazine, uh, made this observation that the Twilights probably were African American because he found in a census, the Vermont census of 1800, the Twilights listed in the far right-hand category that is labeled all other free persons except Indians not taxed. I'm not sure if you can see this on the right-hand column, um, but I wanna draw your attention to how the census was organized at this time. You can see on the left-hand side, three white males, on the right, three white females, and then it's broken, these, these, these groups are broken down into age categories, to age 10, to age 16, 26, 45, over 45, for both white males and for white females. Um, what, what might be blocked, because of how Zoom works, is a category on the right-hand side that says all other free persons except Indians not taxed. Then the next category over would be slaves. Well, this all other, for all other free persons except Indians not taxed means all other free persons of color who are not Native Americans who live on reserves. So if you look at the bottom of this, of this uh, slide, you can see that I have the town of Corinth or Orange County, and you look all the way across to number seven, that is the Twilight family. That was a seven member family and that is where they appear in the census. Okay. <clears throat> I've been, can you, I'm not sure you can hear me now. Um, 
I will probably have to do something with my microphone. Can you let me know, Charlotte, could you let Eva know if you can hear me as I speak with my microphone on top? I'm not on mute. Um, I've been having problems, I'm sorry, with, with this, with this um, microphone. Um, I can hear, we can hear you better. We can hear it's just fuzzy. Yes, it is fuzzy. It's, it's the same as with or without, but a little better. All right, I will proceed. Thank you very much. I need to speak to Dell about this computer. Anyway, so as I was saying, uh, if you look at the bottom uh, town, Corinth, all the way over to the right, you see the number seven, that is the Twilight family in 1800. What is ironic is that in all subsequent censuses after this 1800 census, the Twilights, Alexander, his brothers and sisters, plus his mother, are listed in these three white males, three white females categories. So I, I'm interested in complicating this. What, why does this matter to me? Well, I think it's a very interesting conundrum for us today, not so much for Twilight, but certainly for us today, um, why are we unwilling to see Twilight as he saw himself? A man of ambiguous racial mixture who evidently claimed no racial identity. But we are claiming him as African-American. For sure, Alexander Twilight was a person of African descent. Make no mistake about that. His father, Ichabod, was biracial uh, and probably free because his mother was white. Typically in colonial America, children took on the status of the mother. So he was probably white. We know that his father was black. Um, Ichabod was described as having a yellow complexion and that he was colored. Uh, Alexander's father uh, met, his, met his mother, Mary, um, who we also believe is white, but we're not quite sure. Corinth the records list her as colored, but perhaps seeing Ichabod, the census taker might have assumed she was colored, but, but it's, hard, it's hard to tell. But uh, Ichabod met Mary, Alexander's Twilight, while he was stationed in New York, in Mohawk Valley, in 1782 and 83, when he was with his New Hampshire, New Hampshire Regiment during the American Revolution. Thus, Alexander Twilight was one quarter black. It's only natural that African Americans um, that would claim him as one of us, of course we would. We've always claimed solidarity with mixed race African Americans. Um, besides, blackness is a shared history of oppression, marginalization, and struggle. And regardless of whether you're mixed race or not, you're likely to experience experience that history as well. Uh, so why do I want to complicate Alexander's racial history? I want us to understand what race is, how it is constructed, how it's manipulated, how it is applied, how it's internalized, and how it serves the interests of the white dominant society. So that we reflect in a more nuanced way on Twilight's identity. Race is not a biological category, it's a social construction. It's a schema designed to protect the privilege and the power of white people. That's basically what it is. In North America, anyone with any amount of European genes uh, is identified as, as with that racial group. In other words, if you are of African ancestry, you're black. If you're of Native American ancestry, you're Native. If you are of Asian ancestry, you're Asian. Scholars call this formula hypo-descent. You are that racial group that is furthest, furthest away from whiteness. The inverse of this is hyper-descent. And this is a kind of formula that was applied in Spanish Latin America. So that 
people with some European racial mixture will often identify as, a, as approximating white identity. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that one, one formula or the other is right or wrong or better or less wrong. I'm just, I just want to understand how race was constructed in North America and constructed in Latin America. And perhaps during the Q&A, I can talk about what were the forces behind these two different formulas. I'd be happy to do that. But it seems to me that us, we in the 21st century are being anachronistic if we continue to rely upon this almost two century old formula of the one drop rule to determine one's racial identity, which inform hypo descent. You know, in many ways, I'd like people to be able to identify as they wish, as complicated as, as they'd like that to be. Now, one of the more striking examples of this application of hypo descent involves these children. And here we go again. I think I'm going to have to get a new computer. Excuse me one moment while I Stop sharing and reboot. All right. Okay. I show from the beginning. And let me, yes, okay, good. I want to show this picture of these children. Rosa, Rebecca, Augusta. Uh, Charlie, these children are from New Orleans and they are considered black. As we look at them, they phenotypically look white. Look at Charlie with his blonde hair. Look at Rebecca and Rosa and Augusta with their fair skin and straight, slightly curly hair. Why would they be considered black? because their mothers were one quarter and one eighth black, which was enough to, to enslave them and therefore assign them the designation of blackness, the racial designation of blackness. We have these pictures because abolitionists were able to take these children out of New Orleans. And what they did in 1862 and 1863 was parade them through Philadelphia and New York and while up uh, abolition anger over this institution that was so egregious, so evil, that it dared to enslave white children. But of course, in the South, in New Orleans, these children were not considered white because their mothers were enslaved. But this is an example of the application of hypo descent. Um, perhaps this is what Alexander Twilight was trying to avoid um, during his lifetime. Um, on the left here, we have Alexander Twilight. Um, this is perhaps the only daguerreotype that we have of him. Um, in speaking to Bob Hunt and others, uh, we suspect there might be a second photograph around, but this is the most popular one. This is the one I'm most familiar with. And I have on the right-hand side, Anatole Broyard. Some of you may know who he is, Anatole Broyard. He was a book critic of the New York Times and a columnist for the New York Review of Books in the 1780s, in, uh, in seven, sorry, 1970, 1970s and 1980s. Um, he's from New Orleans also. And it's been said that he was born black, but lived white. His family moved from New Orleans to New York City in the 1920s, and several members of his family passed in order to get good jobs and take advantage of other opportunity. So the question that I have is, if Anatole had not passed in the 1940s and 50s, would he have been able to enjoy his illustrious career as a journalist and live the high life in Connecticut and the Martha Vineyard? Probably not. Probably not. If you want to read about his life, his daughter, Nurse Boyard, wrote a story, wrote the story of his life in a book that she published called One Drop, published in 2007. I bring this up because I'm going to come back to Anatole uh, later on, but here's an example of a man on the right, Royard, who consciously passed in order to take advantage of white privilege. Alexander Twilight on the left, 
I'm not sure we can say he passed. Um, he simply did not claim any kind of identity from what I, from what I can tell, but I continued to research his life. Um, so between the 1820s and 1850s, it seems that Twilight lived a life um, that any white person might live. Uh, perhaps he wanted to avoid the pressures that a lot of uh, African Americans were confronted with at this particular time. One of them was the movement to send black Americans to Liberia. Vermonters, most white Vermonters at this time, 1820s, 1850s, were staunch supporters of this American colonization movement. In fact, the first state to found an auxiliary colonization movement was Vermont, the state that had the least number of African Americans, the fewest number of African Americans living in it, but it was the first state to found an auxiliary society. Uh, so uh, perhaps Twilight wanted to avoid these awkward conversations, perhaps even avoid conversations about slavery, as most Vermonters viewed slavery as a Southern problem, not their problem. Um, I'll just say quickly that most historians believe that um, prior to the Civil War, most biracial African Americans uh, enjoyed greater economic, social, and political advantages than their darker skinned brethren because of their phenotypical approximation to whiteness and their biological connections to white family. However, after the Civil War, that didn't matter. White American racial thought lumped all people of African descent into the common racial category of blackness, which white racial thought defined as immutably degraded, morally, physically, and intellectually, which justified the political, social, and economic exclusion of African Americans. Now, elements of this began to seep in, as I've already alluded to, to, to American consciousness in the second century, uh, second decade of the, eight, of the 19th century. We have not only this American colonization movement to place free Blacks, remove free Blacks from the United States into Liberia, at the same time, we have the movement to remove Native Americans from the east to the west of the Mississippi River. Plus, we have a movement called Amelioration for the Jews, which was to take them out of urban areas, put them out in rural America, convert them to Protestantism, and then perhaps as good Protestants they can come back to urban America. So Twilight perhaps was aware of these efforts of what I call ethnic friends. In Vermont, most black Vermonters lived a tolerably enough existence, I would argue. A historian, Elise Gayette, uh, has studied the black community in Heinsberg in the 19th century. And she reached the conclusion that the few black families who lived on the hill in Heinsberg were by and large welcomed by the white community in Heinsberg. Uh, they were invited to the Baptist church. They were welcomed in the school. They were, they were able to vote at the, at the voting booths. Um, these were, this is the Baptist church. You know, the evidence on accepting African-Americans into the Congregational Church in Heinsberg is a little sketchy. It seems like it was a little less friendly than the Baptist church. But nevertheless, black wives um, and, and husbands of this Hill community were able to form multiracial uh, network relations that facilitated uh, social and political affairs and activities. But it doesn't mean that racism did not exist in Vermont. There was a local pastor by the name of Reverend Charles Bowles, who was a black evangelical minister from Huntington. And some local Vermonters embraced him. They really valued his unblemished character and ability as a preacher. But others rejected him because and called him an enthusiastic disorderly N-word who deigned to inflict his evangelical religious, religious views on them. So Twilight certainly was aware of this kind of treatment. He appears not to have been the target of, these, of this treatment. 
The difference between Twilight and Bowles is that criticism of Twilight was not framed in racial terms the way it was with, for Bowles. So let me talk a little bit about Twilight himself. Good, slides work. <laughs> uh, he was born in um, uh, Bradford, Vermont, on September 23rd, 1795. You can see that Bradford here is in the middle of Orange County, the east side, hugs the New Hampshire border. Um, his father moved there in 1792, uh, I believe, um, perhaps because Vermont's constitution of 1791 outlawed adult slavery. And this attracted many, many free blacks from the Northeast to Vermont um, in the 1790s and in the early 1800s. Um, at the age of eight in 1803, Twilight was indentured out to a neighboring farmer in Corinth. The family was now living in Corinth by 17, late 1790s, nearly 1800s, to a farmer in, in Corinth where he learned to read and write and to cipher, to cipher means to learn to math. Um, and this was a common practice among um, families in the late 18th and early 19th century to apprentice their children out to neighbors in order to be raised up, which means to uh, teach their children a skill or a craft, um, or simply maybe even to feed them and clothe them. Um, the Twilight, we believe, were struggled. They were family that struggled. Um, so this would not have been uncommon for the children to be apprenticed out. Um, but um, Twilight must have been a pretty hard worker uh, because these indentured ships you typically ran until the children reached the age of maturity. For the men, that's 21, for women, that's 18. The Twilight worked off his indentureship at the age of 20. And he quickly, after this, enrolled then into the Randolph Academy, uh, which you can see uh, is just to the southwest of Corinth, Corinth, Chelsea, and then Randolph. He enrolled in Randolph Academy there and attended that school between 1815 and 1821, where he took several courses in preparation for enrolling at Middlebury College. So when he came to Middlebury, he enrolled as a third year student. He was that far advanced. He demonstrated great proficiency in Latin and Greek, uh, in translating English into Latin, um, and he was very talented at doing uh, math and algebra. Uh, during his two years at Middlebury College, and when he was a student here, he attended classes in what you see is the East College. This is the first uh, building, a school building that College erected. Uh, right now, where East College used to stand is a brick building called Twilight Hall, which replaced this building in the, in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and over to the right, I have a picture of the college from 1860. That far right-hand building was the only one of the three that would have been standing when Twilight was a student, and that's Painter Hall. So Twilight would have shuffled between East College and perhaps, um, not perhaps, Painter Hall, that's where the library was at this particular time. He would have uh, commuted between these two buildings for his classes and for his studies. But, but while he was a student at Middlebury College, and then we took the classical education of the day, which was Greek literature and trigonometry, natural philosophy, we call that physics today, surveying, navigation, astronomy, composition and rhetoric, natural theology. He seemed most drawn to natural theology. He checked out of the library 10 times during his two years at Middlebury, William Paley's natural theology which is a treatise um, by this English theologian that argues that God's truths are revealed through nature and the human anatomy. That is, understanding the balance and happiness of humankind within nature reveals God's divine plan. And it seems to me that Paley's ideas informed Twilight's style and content of preaching, for we often invoke the glories and nature of the alien body with his sermons to impart his lessons. Now, critics of natural theology blame its preachers for being too 
deistic in their ideas and not um, uh, pious enough, not, not good, pious Christians, but too scientific, too rational in how they approach theology. In fact, in, in 1833, uh, an ecclesiastical council, which was a body of congregational clergymen who would meet from time to time to hear grievances and try to come up with a remedy, uh, an ecclesiastical council admonished Twilight in 1833 for not being doctrinal enough in his preaching. So it seems to me that Twilight really valued natural theology as a preacher. So we don't know um, how Middlebury students and faculty treated Twilight. Um, the scant evidence we have is that he would disappear for short periods of time. Why? We're not sure. You have to earn tuition money uh, to pay for a room and board. Uh, annual tuition in the early uh, 1820s for Twilight was about $26 a year, which uh, in 2021 was about 640 bucks. Uh, and he also lived off campus. So those who lived off campus would expect to pay a oh, dollar, dollar fifty a week for room and board. So overall, during the 1820s, Twilight's comprehensive annual fee would have been somewhere between $75 and $90, which in today's dollars is only $1,800 to $2,200, which is a far cry from Millerized price tag right now. Um, just want to mention one curious note. Twilight boarded at the house of Mrs. Deming. She lived on Washington Street in Liverpool, if any of you are familiar with that street. Mrs. Deming was a Methodist. From the time of the American Revolution, Northern Methodists were strong anti-slavery advocates. Does this mean then that Mrs. Deming's faith enabled her to see Alexander Twilight, this man of some racial ambiguity, as her equal and therefore entitled to the equal treatment of any military man, including room and board in her home. We can only speculate about that. We also don't know if the college knew that Twilight was a man of color when he matriculated in 1821. The college had no policy on admitting black students at that time. Therefore, I suspect either Middlebury didn't care or, or didn't know. But about a dozen years later, Andrew Harris applied to Millbury College and to Union College and to other colleges. And Millbury and Union turned down Andrew Harris's application because they said the time was not right. What was happening at this time in 1834 is that uh, there were race riots in New York City. And Millbury and Union College used these race riots to claim that their white student body would not accept Harris. Nevertheless, UVM did not flinch. They admitted Harris, who became UVM's first black graduate in 1832. When Twilight graduated in 1823 from Middlebury, he became, as Molly has said, and I've said, the first black graduate of an American cop, Middlebury. After graduation, he landed a job in Crew, New York, where he met and married in 1826, Mercy Ladd Merrill, a white woman about 10 years his junior. Uh, and while teaching in Peru, Twilight continued to read natural theology and continued to preach. And we believe that he in fact was licensed by the Champlain Presbytery in New York, uh, in Plattsburgh, New York. So licensed by the Presbyterian Church. In 1828, Twilight moved to Virginia's. Here you can see in the upper left-hand corner of Addison County, the little community of Virginia's, known as the little, little city of America, I believe. Um, and so he, he taught school in Virginia's, and then on Sundays, he would walk either five miles down to Waltham or six miles up to Ferrisburg to then preach at congregational churches there. Um, but a year later, 1829, Twilight accepted the, the position of preceptor at the Orleans Grammar School in Bradenton, Vermont. Um, the, the, when we say Orleans uh, Grammar Public, uh, Orleans County Grammar School, we mean, a, we mean a public school 
supported by local land rents. He also became the acting pastor at the Brownington Congregational Church, as you can see on the right here. Twilight's reputation just exploded as a popular gifted teacher. And as attendance soared, he attracted nearly 100 boys and girls, which is unique to schools at this time to be coeducational. He attracted about 100 boys and girls each year. And he decided, I need a dormitory to house the resident students, hence Athenian Hall. And I need to make sure that I can uh, rely upon county funds to support my school. What he was worried about is that down in Craftsbury, lower left-hand corner of the county, you can see Brownington almost in the center, down in the left is Craftsbury. What he was worried about was that Craftsbury was planning to build their own public school, which he feared would draw students away from the Orleans County Grammar School. After all, Twilight had poured his life savings into building Athenian Hall. He was in debt. He needed to recoup that money. He needed to keep the school running and open. So what did he do? He ran for state government. He ran as a, to be a representative in that county in the Vermont Assembly, and he won. His goal was to try to stop the Craftsbury School from opening. Unfortunately, he was unsuccessful at that. He was a one issue legislator. And so he only served one one year time term. At this time, there were annual elections for governor, for assembly persons, et cetera, et cetera. So he only served one one year term. But the question I have is why did Craftsbury want to draw their students away from Brownington? Was it a matter of local control? some distance away, as you can see, local control or race matters. You can only speculate about that too. In time, the trustees at the school and the, and the church um, congregation grew tired of Twilight's ways. Perhaps one sign of the congregation growing tired was uh, the simmering discontent over Twilight. Perhaps that's why he was never installed permanently as a minister was always the acting pastor of the Brownington Church, even though white ministers before and after him were officially installed, but not Twilight. Twilight was a stubborn man. He balked at making church offerings. He reasoned, hey, if I'm the pastor of this church, I shouldn't have to make offerings to, to this church. I, I, I'm getting paid. Why should I give my salary over to, to the church? Moreover, he didn't always make his students attend compulsory church uh, services either. And in 1846, another ecclesiastical council reprimanded him for criticizing pastors who had come to Brownington the previous decade. And he also might have put some parents off as well. Although he followed a traditional curriculum of schools at this time, he taught his students logic and moral philosophy and mineralogy and geology and botany and bookkeeping, math, algebra, et cetera, et cetera. I think maybe offering his students laughing gas when they got bored might have been a lesson too far. Especially when one of his students had a bad reaction and Twilight insisted, you better spend the night in my bed tonight. So I can So in 1847, the next year, Mary, Mercy and Alexander were forced to quit the church, quit the school, and they moved across to Canada. Um, they lived in Hatley and Shipley, Shipton, uh, um, Quebec, where Twilight uh, taught school for the next four years. And uh, the, the, the Orleans County School was run by a Middlebury graduate by the name of Reverend William Scales, graduated in 1832. But under his leadership, the school really barely went along, and the school finally closed its doors in 1851. Next year, the trustees begged Alexander and Mercy to come back, and they did. 
that the honeymoon was rather short-lived. Um, Alexander withdrew from the pulpit the following year, 1853, to devote himself full-time to teaching, but we're not quite sure why he withdrew from the, from the, uh, from the pulpit. So ongoing conflicts. Could it be a couple of sermons he gave in, the, in 1853 on slavery? One of the sermons uh, in April, he spoke extemporaneously about the evils of slavery, equating it to intemperance. But then in July, he spoke rather bluntly, arguing that, quote, man has no right to the service of his fellow man without his own consent, unless it is the forfeited right. Here, Twilight had in mind slavery during the age of antiquity, when slavery was based upon conquest, in which he argues American slavery arose. But American slavery justified its principle on, quote, that men do not advance at the same alight or upon the same page at the same rate, owing more to circumstance than other causes. Here, Twilight seems to be signaling to his congregation that race, the fictional circumstance that justified slavery, should never be an impediment to an individual's dreams or an individual's striving. Not clear if the congregation took exception to what Twilight preached. Again, most Romanters thought slavery is not our issue, that's a southern problem. Or, and I think this is more likely, of whether he took exception to the fact that uh, the following year there was going to be a, uh, uh, a Union Methodist Free Will Baptist Church built in town, which I think Twilight feared might draw parishioners from his church and perhaps that caused him to resign. Um, the process of researching this is more fun. Well, the stress of preaching and teaching and responding to criticisms took a toll on Twilight. In 1855, he suffered a paralyzing stroke that left him incapacitated for the next two years. He never recovered from that stroke and he died on June 19th. 1857. The school hobbled along for another couple of years before finally closing its doors permanently in 1859. At this time, uh, Twilight's wife, Mercy, uh, turned Athenian Hall into a boarding house and a tavern. Uh, and then she died in 1878. And the two of them are buried side by side in the Congregational Church's cemetery. They had no children. Alexander Twilight was talented, ambitious, obstinate, driven man who usually got his way. And when he didn't, he set out on his own course. He refused to be defined as others perceived him. He did not let race determine his life, although we might speculate that he had been an impediment now and then. But it was not determinative. And I don't think we should make race determinative of Twilight's identity either, but rather let his racial ambiguity speak for itself and speak to us. Going back to Anatole Broyard, that slide of that New York Review of Books, a New York Times writer, um, his daughter, Bliss, after her dad's death, Anatole's death, asked several family members to submit the DNA test to discern their African ancestry. She sent results off to two labs. Uh, one lab reported that Bliss, the daughter, had zero African genes, and another one found that she had 13% African genes. They found that her, her blonde-haired, blue-eyed brother, one lab said 18% African genes. Her aunt, who was an uh, Anatole's sister, yielded somewhere between 6% and 9% African gene according to the genetic test. The remaining part of their genetic makeup for all the Broyards was predominantly European with a smattering of Native American ancestry as well. So what these um, genetic tests tell me is that A, they're pretty unreliable. And then secondly, 
that perhaps Moriarty's genetic makeup was no more than 20% African. But in the United States, he was black because of the one drop rule. Should we measure twilight by that same rule? I like what Elise Guyette says at the end of her book on early black families in Heinsberg. And that is, we will know that the world has changed when people can choose their own complex identities across racial distinctions and be treated as such. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take whatever questions you may have. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, so um, I, first of all, I just want to address some of the concerns about not being able to hear terribly well. Um, we will um, work to clean up a recording so that you'll be able to hear what you, you didn't understand um, before we send it out. Um, so um, just to let you know that. Um, and that we have some questions here, Bill. So um, I'll, I'll start, I believe this one may have been answered. Um, uh, do we know anything about his brothers and sisters? Um, we know that his brothers and sisters remained in the area. They did have children. Um, there is a, there's a school group uh, in Corinth of the young um, students who have researched the, some of Twilight's siblings. And they have found that they continue to live in the area, that they do have children, that there are descendants today of uh, Twilight siblings who I've not met yet. And so I need to do more research on that side of the family. But what's interesting is that Twilight's brothers and sisters appear in the white columns in all subsequent censuses as well at the 1800s. Uh, but they remained in the area, they married, uh, took white spouses. And so over time, um, that the Twilight siblings largely became white Vermonters, but um, I need to do more research on this. Okay, great, thanks. Um, next question is, uh, it seems that race is a construct that we often force on others. Even if Twilight did not name himself as black, did others around him assign a race to him outside of the one census record? Yes, um, what we have on that is a, a local history of the town of Corinth. And in the local history, um, there are neighbors who, after Twilight died, a lot of town histories were written in the second half of the 19th century. In these town histories, it is some of the neighbors who knew him whispered, oh, oh yeah, we knew that we knew the Twilight from partly because they were probably aware of Ichabod at least who phenotypically looked um, African-American, I would say, a person, a, a, a mixed race, but more phenotypically African-American than not. So people who knew the Twilight family suspected that the family itself was black because of the father. Uh, there's a dean um, at Middlebury College in the late 19th century said, oh yeah, I knew the Twilight for black. I don't know what evidence they have to go by that. Um, if, if we rely upon the census record that contradicts what neighbors are saying, what the dean is saying, but, uh, and then there were his students who didn't discuss his racial identity beyond he was a man who looked swarthy and looked bronze, but I know a lot of white Vermonters who look swarthy and bronze, so <laughs> I don't know what we can do about that. Great, Thank, thanks Bill. Um, okay, we got lots of questions coming in. Uh, can you please restate the principles in the US that people thought slavery was based upon in Twilight's time? Oh yes, so um, I, 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 there might be two parts to this question. Uh, in most of colonial America, and slavery existed in all 13 colonies, at least when it came to children, of some identical, identifiable racial mixture, they inherited the status of the mother. So if the mother was a woman of color and enslaved, the children were 
children of color, and therefore enslaved. If the mother was white and free, the children were children of color, technically these children were free as well. When we think of colonial America and the U.S. as a patriarchal uh, society, but for purposes of enslavement, offspring of women in slave societies follow the status of the mother. I think that may be what, you, what the question is driving at. Okay, um, thanks. So if Twilight didn't identify as black, then what do you think of the Vermont State House plan to identify him as the first black legislator? Um, so, you know, I don't have a problem acknowledging that Twilight was a person of African descent and in our world that makes him black. Um, I've been a part of these conversations uh, with the State House, and I think they are going to contextualize what that, what that means, um, what Twilight's biraciality meant then and means to us today. Um, I, I, you know, I'm willing to accept that he was, I usually don't refer to him as a, as a, as a black person. I refer to him as a, a man of color, a mixed race person, a man of African descent, a man of African ancestry, just to ask us to complicate his racial identity. You know, if they wanna call him the first black legislator in the United States, I'm okay with that as long as then that is contextualized in some kind of um, um, okay. moral, uh, oh. play, some, kind of, some kind of descriptor on the way. So there's a question about um, Mercy. Do you, do you have anything to share about his wife? All I really know about Mercy is that she, her family comes from New Hampshire and they migrated from New Hampshire over to uh, New York, um, where she met Ichabod. And um, the, uh, evidently she, her family was pretty well off. And so she brought you know, a nice dowry to the wedding uh, when she married uh, Alexander. Um, but other than that, um, she was really his helpmate um, at the school. Um, she was involved in the school as well, um, helped, helped Twilight, uh, not necessarily as a teacher, but sort of a, somebody who kept the school in order, um, oversaw the preparation of food and things like that. But um, um, other than that, we don't know, I don't know that much about her. I'm not sure how much more the Stonehouse Museum knows about her. Um, I know that Sounds like she had a pretty sad life after, after Alexander died, um, almost living a life of impoverishment, living, you know, having to rely upon uh, renters, living in um, the stone house uh, across the street from where she was living. Um, and died, um, I think, uh, pretty impoverished. Molly, did you want to add anything? Um, so the old stone house, we do have some personal effects of mercy and some information in, the, in our archival vault. Um, the information that's widely known is pretty much is pretty much mirroring what William just said, what Bill just said. And she did, uh, I, after Alexander Twilight's death, um, she was left in significant debt and so did have to rent out the dormitory. Um, and and um, I, I think it, it disintegrated as well during that period because she didn't have the means quite to, to keep up with the largeness of the building, the upkeep that it was necessary. Um, but she was a, a strong-willed person herself and like William said, backed uh, Alexander Twilight and was a significant part of the upkeep and the running and the logistics of the school and the dormitory on a daily basis. Um, so she was a, an integral and key part of the story there. Thanks, thanks, Molly. Um, let's see. Uh, why did Twilight choose Middlebury College as opposed to, for example, Dartmouth with its mission to educate Native Americans? Yeah, that is a very good um, question. Um, you know, as you know, Dartmouth College had in its charter 
that it would educate uh, Native American students, not at the college, but there's a little grammar school attached to the college where, where it said theoretically we will bring Native students up to speed so they can enroll in Dartmouth College. Uh, that really didn't happen at all. But there were, um, historians are finding that there probably were one or two Black students there at the same time. Um, my feeling is that Alexander Twilight um, simply wanted to go to a Vermont, a Vermont college, uh, he chose Middlebury. It was the one uh, school that its choices were really Middlebury or UVM. Um, and Middlebury had the reputation of being a uh, you know, fine, uh, fine institution. Um, I'm also studying the life of Martin Freeman, who came to Middlebury in 1845. And he came because of connections between his pastor in Rutland and the president of Middlebury College, uh, Lavery, in 1845. I'm, I'm looking for those connections that Twilight might have had um, in, in, in Corinth or Randolph Academy to Middlebury as opposed to Dartmouth. So I suspect there were some connections that, are, that made his entry, his, uh, his matriculation in the Middlebury over Dartmouth much easier. But I'm looking for those connections. Okay, thank you. Um, so here, here's a question. Um, is there a discussion about the appropriateness of Middlebury College claiming Twilight was the first Black graduate if he didn't identify as Black? What is the current thinking on the role of institutions choosing to identify past Black graduates? And how does it help or hinder the conversation of race being a social construct? So in 1974, um, I think complicating racial identity is, is not what it is today. Um, you go to college campuses today and uh, young African-American students will say, I'm not African-American, I'm black. Um, but you'll also find biracial students who demand to identify multiple. Um, so it's, since 1974, Middlebury College has claimed Alexander Twilight as its, its first Black graduate, the first Black graduate in the United States. And so you can understand why that gesture was made in the 1970s. Since then, since critical race theory has become popular in the academy, um, since um, something called the Twilight Project has emerged at Middlebury College, where we're looking at difficult moments of the past. Uh, since over you know, the last 20 years, colleges have, and universities have been investigating their racial pasts involving the slavery, the abolition, the slave trade, etc. I think we're now having a much more complicated conversation over racial identity, racial appropriation, racial assignment, etc. So um, Middlebury, I think, continues to claim Alexander Twilight as the first black graduate of American college. And it can do that. But at the same time, many of us are complicating that conversation by asking, well, what does that mean when we're discussing a person who never claimed a racial identity? He might have been identified as up by others as that, but he himself did not claim that identity. So should we claim that identity? Uh, it, it, it's a very complicated question. There's not an easy answer to this. This is going to be something that uh, Middlebury and other colleges will be engaged in for the next you know, decade or two. Uh, I'm not sure this will ever be a settled conversation. Thanks, Bill. Um, are you, are you, do you want to keep going with some more questions? How um, yeah, we'll go for another five, ten minutes. Five minutes? If, uh, okay. Um, here's a Quick one, uh, maybe not quick. If Twilight preached at Baptist and Methodist churches, why is he buried in a congregational cemetery? Yeah. What's interesting is that um, I, I mentioned that he was probably licensed by a Presbyterian church in New York. Um, historians disagree on that, but I think he probably was. 
So you might ask, well, if he was licensed by a Presbyterian church, how could he even preach in a congregational church? Well, there's so few ministers to churches in Vermont for the first half of the 19th century that the Presbyterian and the congregational churches had an agreement in Vermont that they could share each other's pastors without a problem. And that agreement lasted until, um, until the 1850s. And then they tended to go their separate ways. But uh, Alexander Twilight was invited to be the acting pastor at the Brownington Congregational Church, even though he had a Presbyterian license. And that was, that was okay. Um, what was less okay, I think, was his, was his teaching of his natural theology, which many thought was neither Presbyterian nor Congregational. But because he was the acting pastor in the Congregational Church, and because he did that for so many years, um, I don't think the church had a problem um, burying him in, in, in their cemetery. The question might be, where else would they be buried? To be buried in the local churchyard was the custom of the day. So it makes sense that, that that's where he, he and others would be. Uh, here's, here's one about um, Frederick Douglass. Is there any evidence that he met Fred, Frederick Douglass in 1843 at Middlebury, which sounded like a rough meeting, or Ferrisburg, which Robinson and Murray made more welcoming, though he reportedly had something thrown at him at the latter? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, uh, there's no evidence that Twilight uh, crossed paths with Frederick Douglass. I wish that were the case. Um, and, and good catch. You're absolutely right. Frederick Douglass was here in 1843 in Middlebury and Ferrisburg. Middlebury was the first stop on the 100 city convention tour that William Garrison and Douglass and others organized to travel to Vermont, New York, and Ohio, and Indiana in order to spread the good word of abolition. And the very first stop on this tour was Middlebury. Um, so he, in 1843, he was twilight with deeply ensconced in Brownington. And as far as I know, uh, the two of them never met. Twilight certainly would have been aware of, uh, of uh, Douglas through his writing and publications in his North Star newspaper. But as far as I know, he never met. Well, there are a lot of questions here. I've been toggling back and forth between Q&A and chats. And I know a lot of you haven't had your questions answered, but as Claire said, she will be sending an email. Um, I, Claire, I don't know if that will come a little later if we're going to try to um, clean up the recording a little bit um, so people can, um, can understand some of the things that they missed. Um, it, um, but Bill, we want to thank you so much. This is a lot of thought-provoking things you said here about race as a construct. And I was um, uh, noting something on the um, Old Stonehouse Museum website about even looking at a, a daguerreotype and making assumptions based on what you see. And I, I never thought about that, you know, like how you look at something and you, you make a judgment, you know, this this is exactly how he looked or who, who is he or he's black or he's not black or um, it puts into question a lot of things. Yes, thank you. And um, yet this is a striking, striking daguerreotype that shows to me a man with straight hair, probably light eyes as you look at it. Um, we can't tell what his complexion is He's obviously a man of some, some ethnicity, at least, um, and according to American constructions of race, that makes him black. And I just am asking us in the 21st century, can we think more critically, in more complex ways, maybe more creatively about race? Yeah. Well, it's been, it's, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who joined us. Um, and we will be in touch with you all by email in the next few days. Um, and Bill, thanks again. And Molly. Thank you, <laughs> thank you everyone for coming. Thank, thank you, you so much, it. everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.